Yeah, I'm sweating. I'm sweating. It's not just because it really is the hottest day of the year here in London. It doesn't look like London, but it really is London. Um, but, um, yeah, as I was just saying, I'm more nervous than a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. And I got that from Tex Thompson. Thank you very much, Tex. Let's meet our two amazing guests today who are going to act as our guinea pigs. No, no, our special guests to test our new scoring system. It's Bella. It's fabulous to have you back. Bella Pearson, Guppy Books Co. UK. One of the publishers I know who's got the best possible taste in publishing, actually, is Bella. Uh, all I have to do is name the boy in the striped pyjamas before I die. The huge success by Jenny Dunham. Art of Being Normal. She's got mm -hmm. extraordinary taste. We're going to be talking about that in a minute, Bella. But right now, I would like you to tell us two things about yourself one of which is actually true. Okay, well, um, the first thing is that in my publishing career, two books I've acquired have become Hollywood movies. Yeah. The second one is, out of the first 12 titles published by Guppy, which is two years of publishing, two of them have been chosen as Sunday Times Book of the Week. Oh, I see. Gosh, they can't both be true. Only one is true. We'll find out in a minute. Hello, Jeff. Much love, Jeff. Um, eminent Hello. Latopian. No, actually, esteemed Latopian, actually. That's what I was calling you. Um, you how are you doing? Are you sweating like everybody else in the UK? Yes. Flat roof house and I'm on the, on the top floor. So, yes, I am sweating quite a bit. So yeah, I can believe it, too. Same question to you, Jeff. Um, we know quite a lot about you, especially uh, your fellow Latopians in the genius room right now. But we mm -hmm. would like to know two further things about you, one of which is true and one of which is not. Yeah, it was a bit longer. Wasn't it? It's, uh, first one really is, uh, I did a lot of travelling and things, um, obviously going to confront courage from my work and things. Obviously the place went down was close to Black Sea into Russia and uh, I was invited along to lunch with um, some of the Russian colleagues and... Uh, I think it went well. There was a lot of drinking and everything. It was a bit more heavy lunch than I thought it was going to be. But, uh, but at the end, of the, uh, the end of the lunch thing, everybody was seen to go downstairs into um, a big area. And uh -huh. The sports game we're at. And it was uh, a ch changing room. So everybody started taking their clothes off um, and changing. <laughs> and I thought, well, this is a bit funny. <laughs> I was supposed to watch a rush. Uh -huh. Anyway, so um, what happened was um, I... Um, and they said, oh, you're going to come and swim. What we're going to do is we go for sauna, and then we actually go for um, we go for this uh, dip in the, in the River Don afterwards. It's a bit strange. But you can come in as well. So I can't actually. It's got a suit on and everything else. There. Well, no, I mean, so you take clothes off, and they just you know, take your clothes off, you'll be fine. Um, I said, well, you know, I'm my underpants. Um, so yeah, your underpants will be fine. <laughs> anyway, the reason why I was embarrassed is that um, on my underpants, they had um, <laughs> there was my, my son, they were bright red. With big, huge yellow teddies on there. Just Aww. Cool. Aww. So it was great for me, but uh, I bonded with my Russian friends. But um, yeah, that, that was quite experience. <laughs> I'll be really um, disappointed if that's if that's not true. So uh, you've got a second <laughs> one, which is uh, uh, second your second your second book. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I didn't realise mine was probably, probably a bit long ago. <laughs> yeah. The second one is that um, I was. I remember years ago. Um, years ago, I was a small child going up to the mountains with my father in Wales. And we've got up at the top there. The weather starts to change very badly, so we let go home. So, the what happened is that um, as you could get back in the car, he slipped and hurt his foot. I really badly hurt his foot, so he couldn't drive. I was living at the time, so the only way we could get into the car and get home, get back. So, so there was no telephones. It was before obviously internet, before mobile phones. I actually had to drive as a eleven-year-old, part down these mountains, passes and things like that. Go down all these tiny roads to get down to a telephone box because we could phone our mother, could then come and come collect us and pick us up, and she could drive. Wow. That's the second one. Okay, and well, I have no play. idea at all which, which uh, they both seem highly improbable to me, but our genius room. Yeah. And if you're watching uh, on YouTube right now, you can you can you can guess as well which one of our two guests um which uh, which version of their stories are correct or not right now i would like to look at the very first submission of the day here we go and it comes from andrew hello Ooh, good heavens above andrew's with us live on youtube which is fantastic andrew mccray it's literary fiction uh you've got a qr code there so if you want to scan that and go to, I guess it'll be Andrew's website, but you never know. And it's called Dance of the Cookholds. I'm going to read you Andrew's blurb. Here it goes. Terry, a socially challenged programmer, is placed in a theatre where he's befriended by an aspiring actor who suggests an acting class 
as a crash course in personal relations. But the lessons learned are not all on the plan. The theatre's musical adaptation of The Country Wife, that's a restoration comedy, isn't that? A bawdy one. Is in crisis as the composer has died. Terry's dad, a washed up composer, could he be the fix? Cookholds translates the sexual antics of the restoration play into a comedy of mores and manners for the age of hashtag me too. All right. Let me tell you about Andrew. Um, I've placed a number of short stories, says Andrew, in Canadian literary journals and anthologies and was the fiction editor of a short-lived literary journal. A lot of them tend to be. Uh, I've also immeasurably benefited from the mentorship of the late Austin Clark, winner of the Giller Prize and the Commonwealth Prize. Over the course of my checkered career, my occupations include park ranger, darkroom technician. That dates you, actually, doesn't it? Fixer. Um, <laughs> animated stand operator, public relations and corporate communications writer, video editor and director, photographer, business presentations producer, and mobile app and web developer. I live in Toronto, Toronto under the supervision of my cat, Hodge. Hello. I enjoy skiing in winter and uh, conversing with the loons in summer. And with the birds, I assume. And I sing Gregorian chant whenever they'll let me. Currently illegal, I believe, in the UK. Fantastic. Um, tell you, Andrew, what we've got for you is a fabulous reading by Emily. Dance of the Cuckolds by Andrew. Read by Emily. Terry is paused on the threshold of the theatre's backstage doorway, blinking in the midday spring sunshine. He's been toiling all night at his keyboard, playing a perverse game of whack-a-mole, where the correction of one error in his code would only see the compiled process come to a grinding halt in a cascade of ever more obscure error messages. With each one that he fixes, the listing only seems to go longer, until finally with a shit and a damn and a fuck a duck, he jabs the power button on his work computer, slams shut the lid of his laptop, jams it into his backpack, and lets his head sag until it rests against the monitor. The fatigue that he's been pushing against all night is pushing back, but at the same time, some whiff of the spring weather outside is somehow filtering into his cramped and stuffy cubicle, calling him away. And so he comes to stand on the threshold of a dazzling spring day, blinking in the light, snuffling at the damp, earthy smells rising from the newly dug flower bed which border the theatre building, shaking off the foggy darkness of his faintly glowing burrow. After a pause, he sets out through the small park across the street, looking up as if for the first time at the low-hanging branches of the plane trees, at the swiftly unfurling leaves bursting forth from their buds, and hearing the chatter of the robins as they scout out nesting sites and gather building supplies. He stops, and with a crap, he realises he's forgotten his phone, tethered to the desktop computer for recharging. But with a fuck it, fuck it in a red rubber bucket, he dismisses the notion of going back to retrieve it. Let it rot, he thinks, as if silicon could rot, and pulls partway down the zipper of his windbreaker. It really is too warm. Almost in a daze, Terry wanders through the park and up a barren side street, which abruptly opens onto Queen Street and gazes out onto the streetscape as if he's never seen it before. Which is possible. Normally he takes the Dufferin bus to King, where he either transfers to the streetcar, or walks the short leg west to the theatre. And he only ventures out to go to a convenience store in King for supplies of red bull and potato chips that fuel his nocturnal labours. Now, as he comes to the brink of this river of humanity, he pauses, hesitates looking first one way, then the other. What is he doing here? What distant music has drawn him out of his lair? Has he lost his thread? He looks to the left and to the right, to the west and to the east, and glances over his shoulder in the direction of the theatre, now out of sight, as if some stern call of duty is nagging him to return and continue pounding away on his keyboard. With a grunt, he tries to unzip his windbreaker, but as so often happens, the zipper has pinched the cloth and refuses to slide to the end of its track. Savagely, he pulls at it, but it's no use. It's completely jammed. He grabs both corners of the windbreaker and yanks it apart, but the zipper track only rips out of the fabric without releasing, so he pulls the jacket off over his head and flings it towards a pile of garbage, waiting for collection. 
He starts to head out along Queen Street when he's accosted by taunts from a gaggle of girls hanging out at the doorway of the Big Bop. Way to go, big boy. Wait till your mommy finds out. Are you ever in the doo-doo? And they burst into laughter, falling into each other's arms in delight. They appear to be schoolgirls, dressed in blazers and plaid skirts, though they have hitched their skirts well up above their knees and lined their eyes with coal in an effort to look like they belong here rather than in some non-supervised classroom. And who can blame them on such a beckoning spring day? So there we are. And before we go any further, please allow me to explain the new voting system that I think actually should be pretty pretty straightforward. But let me just run through it really quickly. So here you, here you go, guys. This is a Genius Room uh, voter, litopia.com slash vote. And each submission, that was submission number one, obviously you've got to keep track of the numbers. Each submission has its own individual voting box here. As I move the cursor over, cunningly, you can see that the number of stars in across four different categories is illuminated now let's just explain those categories they're pretty straightforward and there's a little note above there as well uh just in case you forget what a title is i don't think you will um so we want you to rate the title to begin with do you, how much do you like it how much you you're engaging with it you is it off-putting actually i'm going to make you want to to walk away from it the blurb pretty much the same thing if you imagine uh, the physical book look at the title flip it over on the back look at the blurb does it do the job does it interest you does it sell you on the idea of the book enough to to really commit to to getting into it or does it not you can give it one star which means it doesn't really work for you or you can give it five stars which means it really works for you powerfully or you can give it something in between they last two are a kind of a much needed development because what we've done is we've separated things out quite often i've noticed in the junior room you've really liked the writing but it hasn't been at least from me in a particularly commercial package so we're separating those two things out right now craft refers to how much do you really like the sheer writing skills on display again from one to five forget about whether it's commercial or not doesn't matter for that particular data point the final one though is as kate calls it bang for the buck it's the commercial side irrespective of the writing yeah i'm, I'm serious irrespective of the writing is this a commercial proposition would you be likely to lay out your hard-earned cash for this particular book so please help all our authors and andrew bless him is our very very first one to to do the beta testing on this i don't know if he realized that or not um so help our authors by filling out each one of those um data points from one to five and when you've done it it's a little vote button there and it's replicated for each submission today each one of five submissions press the vote button and it will go straight into the system and be accounted for i hope that's clear all right i'm going to ask now who should we ask let's say bella oh you voted oh look at that it's worked <laughs> <laughs> it's worked all right tell us about your overall reaction and then why you've given it what you've given it uh right so um i really like the title because it's very interesting and um i like the play on on words um the blurb interestingly um i liked the content of the blurb but i couldn't really put it all together so yeah. it didn't really make much sense to me as a story as what you know what was actually happening here but I, but a lot of it appealed to me so um i've given it four well i gave it three uh two is that two yes it comes up differently yeah it's it's um, translated those into percentages into yeah. Percentage, yeah yeah and then um because although i like the, the the bits it didn't quite hang together for me so i didn't really get a version of what the book was about uh craft i thought the writing was was much of it was very nice but there was too much of it in my view it needed um editing down it needed tightening it needed to get into the action faster but the actual writing it was visual i could see feel i could see myself there right you know i could um, um, you know, him coming out of his little bubble you know I, I i could really see it and hear it but it yeah. just was too long um and as for bang i think that was that was a tricky one because at, at the end i'm still quite intrigued as to what the book's about hmm. but i don't know because of course the blurb i don't think really represented it properly um, and yeah. i think that it obviously has more potential in it 
Than, than I, I like the different. idea of the um, of the restoration, uh, bawdy restoration yeah. comedy brought up to date. That's a very interesting Absolutely. thing. Um, yeah. It could be a bit dangerous. It could be something that um, present day uh, uh, people uh, don't find particularly um, exciting. Um, I don't know. Let's have the a look at... The aspect is interesting as well. And the whole, something set within that um, sort of environment is really appealing, I think, if you've got them. Um, yeah, I think so yeah. too. Uh, Jeff, tell us, uh, tell us why you voted the way you have done. Okay, fine. Well, t- I quite like the title as well. I thought it was a good, you know, decent, reasonable title to have. I didn't mind the blurb. I thought there was something in the blurb. That I thought uh, the trouble was the blurb didn't really relate to the story particularly. I, I thought it would be the submission we had there. I didn't quite like that blurb. Um, I got lost halfway through in what was happening. There seemed to be so much going on in the story. Yeah, um, it was. The, I couldn't see it. It flowed. The, the story was, it was obviously there, there somewhere, but I just couldn't see it. And I couldn't invest in the. Um, uh, I forget his name now. Actually, um, I found Andrew. Him a bit Andrew, too he's with us. Angry. He's with us now. Yeah. Okay, like Andrew. Yeah, I couldn't invest in the, the character either um, mm. because I just found it too. I don't know. It's a spoilt, rather foul-mouthed. I wanted to see why it would be great if it said why it was like that. Why it was in that sort of mood? That was some, maybe I've listed a bit more. I found it to be oh, okay. a little bit annoying. You know, he was. Yeah. I couldn't invest him in the first anyway, sort of thing. Yeah, um, I mis- I misled you slightly because actually Andrew is the author. You're talking about the protagonist. The protagonist yes, the protagonist, is actually yeah, yeah. is is he's Terry actually. Terry, Terry, yeah, I couldn't remember yeah. his name. Yeah, but I just found him a bit too over the top, really. This just effing and blinding all the time. Um, I thought the writing was there, of course, not was good writing in there. That you can see that. Um, from commercial value, I don't know, from my point of view, I would probably more the book I'd actually buy. You wouldn't, you wouldn't buy it. All right, let's have a look yeah, at the yeah, overall yeah. School, school board here. And we've, we're getting the votes in right now. Um, Genius Room has gone for, these are 60, these are all um, uh, escalated up two percentages. So Genius Room says 67% of the title. They, they pretty much like it. Bella likes it a lot. Half and half on the blurb of the genius room. Again, half and half on the craft. And do they think it's that commercial slightly less, less than half? So overall, Andrew, you've got a 53. I just want to say I'd like to be transfixed a bit more uh, like Bella. I'm very interested in this, I think, quite original concept of bringing a very bawdy restoration comedy um, into the 21st century. I, I like that idea. I don't quite know where you're, you're going with it. And I'd like more attack in in the first page or two. I'd like to be absolutely transfixed. We get the idea that your protagonist, Terry, is, is, is well and truly pissed off. But what else? There's got to be something else. And finally, I just want to say... Your opening reminds me very much of um, a dear departed client of mine who wrote a book called the Murdstone Trilogy. Oh. Your, do you know that, Bella, do you? I do, yes. <laughs> I love that book. I love that book too. What a biting satire it is on, on our industry. Um, if, you, if you get this, actually, Andrew, the Murdstone Trilogy, you can get it on, on Amazon, you will find the opening deals with an equally pissed off protagonist and kind of ends in kind of the same way as yours does too but mal's attack is much stronger than yours you can take it further um hopefully that's of some use when you join our weekly huddle certain things happen no not that bring your writing your book titles your blurbs anything really for expert and sympathetic input in confidence other websites charge a fortune for this kind of thing in latopia the oldest community for writers on the net is included in your modest subscription latopia we're here for you there you go and our second submission of the day comes from sharon who i think is is with us right now let me just uh click a button there all these buttons are completely new to me hello sharon very good to have you along. We will uh, be uh, telling the whole internet about you in just a moment or two. This is Travel Memoir slash Humour. And it's, uh, it's got an interesting title. It's so long, actually, that it doesn't fit on our screen. But I'll read the whole thing. Secret lands, petrol clams, and a bag full of Bolivar. Hmm. And this is your blurb. Imagine Sharon's horror as her backpack, filled to the brim with illegal banknotes, enters an x-ray machine at a Venezuelan airport, resulting in being forced to gift money to the corrupt official checking her bag. 
or continuous bowing to dead leaders housed in glass coffins in North Korea and watching the most spectacular live synchronized gymnastic show with Kim Jong-un meters from your seat so I think I'll be able to watch the show get ready to laugh as Sharon takes you on an extraordinary journey around the world and Sharon is with us right now and let me tell everyone about you Sharon I was born you say in Yorkshire and I've been traveling in between work contracts since 1999. I wrote my first book in 2014 whilst house sitting in the Blue Mountains. How lovely. For an Australian couple I met while traveling in West Africa. You are international, aren't you? Uh, I'm currently back in Australia. Gosh, I wonder what time of day it is with you. Reside in Emerald Beach until my visa expires in December when, uh, when sadly I'll have to return to my home in Leeds. Great. All right. Well, you need an international sort of reading from a, a very cosmopolitan sort of chap. And it's going to be Martin. Secret Lands, Petrol Clams and a Bag Full of Bolivar by Sharon. Read by Martin. Give me dollar, ten dollar, demanded the Venezuelan airport official. He had just seen thousands of banknotes, not just ordinary banknotes, but illegal black market banknotes. Hundreds of wads stuffed into our day packs. Matt's usual happy face was white as a ghost, ashen with worry. If I'm honest, it looked like he was going to throw up. Oh my God, what should we do? Should we just give him some money? Whispered Matt. Call Elias, was my immediate response. You may well be thinking, have they robbed a bank? Which seems a reasonable assumption considering the bags full of money we were carrying. To explain, I need to go back to when Matt and I were organising our trip to Venezuela. We knew it was a country that could possibly be difficult to travel around, and even more tricky was the current money situation. The largest banknote available was the 100 Bolivar, which is e equivalent to around 3 American cents or 2 pence. This was problematic. Due to Venezuela being in an economic crisis since 2014, the official exchange rate is now one of the least valued currencies in the world. A hundred Bolivar using the official exchange rate would equate to roughly 10 American dollars at that time, or eight British pounds. With this in mind, we thought it best to look at tour operators, even though it wasn't particularly what we wanted to do. Then Matt discovered Hike Venezuela. This company was run by a German guy and we basically arranged a bespoke itinerary which included every place we wanted to visit. This also included all transport, whether it be public, a public bus, plane or a private driver. This is how we met Elias. He was our advisor, driver and fixer. Elias met us at the airport when we entered Venezuela in the city of Valencia, which is in the north of the country. Elias was the man who could fix things. He had thinning, wavy hair, mostly grey, probably from all those years of fixing. He was medium height and weight with sharp, watchful eyes and a tense demeanour. He was soft-spoken, yet very commanding. Most likely in his early sixties, then again, all those years of fixing could have affected his youthful looks. A mobile phone was glued to his ear as he relentlessly fixed things. The calls he was receiving was certainly not his mother or children. In a flurry of Spanish, he issued, issued instructions to the callers. It was incessant, call after call. With Elias was George. He looked like he'd just walked off the set of Starsky and Hutch with his immaculate, thick, flick, dark hair. By the colour of his skin, he clearly liked the outdoors. A short man wearing a tight-fitted blue short-sleeved shirt that displayed his toned arms. George's English was very limited, but his job was to drive not instruct. Elias was the man in charge, the fixer. No one flies to Venezuela. There must have only been a dozen passengers which made it easy for Elias to spot us. Our big pack packs would have also been a good clue. Hello, you must be Matthew and Sharon. Welcome to Venezuela. After introductions, we were led to George's car. It was an old saloon car, which had certainly seen some mileage. Backpacks were placed in the boot. Destination, Caracas. Matt, I want you to sit in the front passenger seat with George and I'll sit in the back with Sharon. He then went on to explain that in Venezuela, it is illegal for anyone to be taxiing people in their own private vehicles. 
If we did get stopped by the police, police, Elias would do all the talking, which frankly he would have to as our Spanish speaking skills were limited to pleasantries, ordering food and asking directions. Anything outside this remit would be a tad difficult. Once in the car, in our allocated seats, we began the 170 kilometre drive to Caracas. This was when Elias produced the incriminating banknotes. I had seen a black plastic bin liner by Elias's feet, half rammed beneath Matt's front seat, but thought nothing of it. As Elias grappled with the flimsy bag, I caught a glimpse of what would become the burdensome banknotes. Burdensome banknotes? Don't know about that. Um, Jeff, first reactions, please. I like the title. It was great. You did the rhythm to it. I really, I really, really like that. It it's a Marmite to, uh, title, isn't it? You either love it or don't. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, did, I really like that. Um, I like the, as we started the story, I was the blow, oh, sorry, sorry, Mr. Blow. Blow, yeah, I thought the blow, blow was interesting as well. It had some, some detail in there. It was, it give it a good start of the story and give us some anticipation of what was to come. Which was great. When the first, I think the first part of the story was good about it got to Valencia. The the officials there, although I think the official probably be asking for more than ten dollars if you got a bag full of a bag full of money. Yeah, um, probably not realistic. That was great. It was a good start, and it suddenly we went into this. You know, it stops. The story, story tends to stop there, and we're back. You know, back in the past, looking at looking at an info dump, like somebody called it. And it slowed everything down. Yeah, for me. yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think that's a general feeling, actually. I think the chat yeah. felt that, and I thought that too. Yeah. Too much description, um, everything else, and then we seem to be going back into the car with, his, with George, um, or George and Elias on the way back to somewhere else, too, which confused me a little bit because I thought we were just arriving in Venezuela. Um, and then we're actually in Venezuela now, so I yeah, I'm not confused. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think there's a missed opportunity there. Um, yeah. Jeff, got to ask you, have you actually pressed the vote button yet? Oh, sorry, I haven't. Oh, thank heavens. I, I thought our system would... As it goes. As I'm so goes, pleased right? to hear that. <laughs> there you go. Oh, you love the title, don't you? Isn't that interesting? You love the title. You love the title. Yeah, and actually, 60, 60, 60, not bad. Not bad going. Um, I'm not saying there is something in there with the story thing. I think it's in there, but it needs to be really edited a lot and cut down yeah. and sort of... You know, to get that start bit, keep on that first and before you go to the info dump later. Very good advice. I think that is pretty much what the chat room has been saying. Um, I, as you can see, actually, I'm not big on the title. I'm one of those, actually, I do like Marmite, but I don't, I just, I don't know. It just doesn't do anything for me, actually, Sharon. But it, Jeff loves it. So who am I to, who am I to criticize? <laughs> Vagabond doesn't like it. <laughs> Johnny does like it. Let's see what Bella thinks. I liked it. You well. like it. I All right. It, it took a little while to get it into my head, but it was, I, I thought, yeah, I liked it. I could see it on the cover of a book. And I All could, right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, and again, I think I've voted exactly the same as Jeff, actually. But um, I thought it was, I thought the writing was good, but it, it didn't sing quite yeah. and, and the beginning yeah. you know it was fabulous with the action but yeah i think my general feeling was exactly the same um, yeah it could have been elevated into something much more exciting and, and also a bit more of the sense of place as well yeah uh, quite yeah. Early on, i think needs to come out um, yeah it's but, it's a great yeah. setup i mean everyone has you know at some point or other has actually sweated in front of some noxious customs official um, I certainly have, um, um, and I, I didn't have a, a suitcase full of banknotes. But you know, imagine being in that situation. Fantastic setup, but I don't know where you're going to go with it, Sharon. You're starting to talk to us about other stuff, you know. So it's it's, it's a great. I think everyone in the chat room is saying the same thing. It's a great start, great setup, <gasps> but then you just you know you kind of you waste it. So yeah, what else? Oh gosh, uh, that's interesting because I can't. It's Lex is giving so much detail. I actually can't read it he's so small so i think that maybe that's something we got to fix actually don't you let's have a look at the um the running scores so far now we're two submissions in that's the second submission very close indeed actually andrew got 52 um sharon's just got 55 only three points in it um i tell you what i think we should do we should um just come back to to bella for a quick check because no one has actually 
offered any views at all as to which or t- which truth or consequences is correct uh, and i and i've forgotten the second one so t- the first uh, one um, the first one is two hollywood movies the second one is is what it was the fir- out of the first 12 titles published in the last two years by guppy uh, two yeah. of them have been chosen as sunday times children's book of the week okay two well, that, that could both be true two sunday times book of the week so come on genius room with jeff it's pretty straightforward it's either 11 year old baby driver basically or his <laughs> teddy rugs pin underpants <laughs> again both of which could possibly be true but with bella it's two hollywood movies or two sunday times um children's book of the uh, the 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 month and um i think that's going to be extremely tough to just decide let's have a look at submission number three it's from Stephanie, it's Middle Grey Fantasy. It's called Princess Iris, aka Speary and the Quest. And let's just see if that's been truncated. Yes, it has been. And the Quest for the Magic Knot Hole. All right. Now, let me read you Stephanie's blurb. Hello, Stephanie. Good to have you along. Love your hat. Very special. Princess Iris, a.k.a. Speary, is living in exile and longs to return to her homeland. The only way back is through a key which will open the magic knot hole to the portal to their beloved fairy sphere. Speary is confined to the palace grounds because the evil ones inhabit the forbidden forest. Speary takes matters into her own hands and devises a plan to steal the key. She's determined to, uh, to succeed and unlock the portal to Fairy Sphere, provo- proving that girls are capable of more than learning manners. Well, does that need proving? Apparently it does in Fairy Sphere. Let me tell, uh, let me tell everybody about you. Um, I grew up in the foothills fo- foot of Appalachia. How interesting. Appalachian Spring. Um, I'm a wife, mom, a nana. I've taught in four states and an international school in Thailand. I'm a graduate of the Institute of Children's Literature and a member of Skawui. I'm not going to spell all that out. I belong to the uh, Southern Higher Writers Collaborative. Several of my stories are published in their anthologies. After living away for over 30 years, I returned to my hometown and helped to found a non-profit to revitalize our village. What a great thing to do. And I'm delighted to tell you that we've got Emily to read it. Princess Iris, a.k.a. Speary, The Quest for the Magic Knothole by Stephanie, read by Emily. Chapter One Speary leaned out the palace window, her stomach flat against the sill. Gusts of wind blew, and clouds covered the sky like a giant tablecloth. She swivelled her head, the spyglass tight against her eye. Her lips twitched upward as she spotted Cadmus. A quiver was on his back, and he was lugging a large leather satchel, and a rolled blanket was wedged under his arm. Now the prince was in her sights, running to catch up to Cadmus. They were home from the learning. Suddenly Speary gasped as she pitched forward, struggling to gain her balance. Her arm shot out, and she grabbed the purple drapes. She lurched backward and smashed against the stone floor, her body swathed in a jumble of velvet. Thrashing back and forth, she frantically tried to dislodge herself. Her head popped out from the yards of fabric just as the door to the classroom opened. Speary grimaced. Governess Stella did not look happy. What am I to do with you, Princess Iris? Look at you. You've torn the drapes from the wall. You know I'd have to tell the Queen about this. It's not good for a princess to be so bad. Speary threw off the curtains, slamming a palm against the spyglass still in her fist, causing it to collapse. She jumped up and stomped a slipper-clad foot. I've asked you to call me Speary. I insist on it as a member of the royal family. She crossed her arms in defiance. If you must tell the Queen, so be it. I'm tired of being stuck in the castle, learning about manners. King Regan and Queen Aura christened you, Princess Iris the Iridescent, not Speary. That's a ridiculous name. You'll be a teen princess soon, and your royal duties will be expanded. There will be much to keep you busy inside and outside the palace. Speary flung her arms about her in frustration pacing the length of the room. In two months I'll be thirteen, and mother and father treat me like a toddler. She plopped on a gilded bench and tugged at her red curls. I just saw Edric and Cadmus. They're back from the camping trip. I petitioned Papa to allow girls to go, 
but he wouldn't hear of it. So they've been given all the mysteries of our homeland while I'm stuck here studying Fairy Princess Deportment 101. She pounded her fist against her knee. Governess sat next to Spiri. I do understand that life within the palace walls can be boring for a princess, but your parents are trying to keep you safe from the evil ones. Spiri leaned against the wall. I just want to return to Fairy Sphere and see the stars. I've only read about them in books and seen the ones painted on the throne room ceiling. Please, tell me again how you learned the constellations. Princess, I've told you that story many times. Just once more. All right, agreed Governess, but only if you promise you'll work hard in class and you must promise to read from your new book, Courtly Manners for a Fairy Princess. Speary crossed her fingers behind her back and gritted her teeth. I promise, she said solemnly. Well then, began Governess, on hot, humid nights in Fairy Sphere, our family would sleep outside. Mother would find the softest toadstools to make our beds, and we would stretch out and gaze at the stars in the heavens. You left out the part about your stuffed animal. Oh yes, Governess smiled. I always had my toady with me, and my special blanket. Father pointed out the constellations. My favourite was Ursa Major, the Great Bear. It consists of seven stars and is the largest. Just a minute, let me get my journal. Speary pulled her book from her desk drawer, flipping to the page of her drawings of the constellations. She offered it to Governess. Please, draw it from me. I'm learning the formation so when I do see the night sky in Fairy Sphere, I recognise them. Governess took the book and a heavy sigh escaped her lips as she sketched the great bear. There, she said, running her finger along the drawing. That is the shape of the Ursa Major. Uh Aha. So I've just voted... Um, not being on the title blurb. I, the blurb is a synopsis, actually, Stephanie. You said the wrong blurb! Ah! <laughs> no! Oh, not a dreadful thing to do. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, well, I was just going to say it's, it's not really blurb, it's a synopsis. The challenge of the modern fairy tale. It's very dif- difficult, isn't it? Bella. Um, what advice would you give to, to Stephanie about tackling such a, 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 a challenging genre? I think it is a challenging genre, and I think um, often in fact, uh, people think it isn't because it's the young people, but actually it's one of the most challenging. Um, I wasn't very keen on the title because it felt too lengthy. Um, I think it could have been much more pithy and engaging. Um, it's got lots in it, you can tell. And I think the writing actually was really nice, some of it. It didn't, for me, grab me. I think it's got to have a little more to take that child reader in. And, and the children are so. Um, they will put it down immediately if they're not they taken will. in. I think it just needed a bit more than that. I mean, I like the setting of the scene. I thought it was excellent. But, um, yeah, I, I was... And also the blurb. I'm, I'm sorry you sent the wrong one in because obviously that didn't sort of represent the story as, as I would have um, no. wanted. Um, so, yeah, I think it just needs a bit more pizzazz to draw your young reader in, a bit more stick with that action, a bit less going back into the sort of past. And I know you need to say why she's desperate to get back to fairy sphere, but I think it does um, it does yeah. need to be more engaging at that very beginning. Yeah, yeah fair enough. Okay, Jeff. Yeah, I agree with what Bella uh, she's saying, really. Um, it's a nice writer, confident writing. Um, the title didn't think much of it. Well, it's an okay title. Um, the blurb up was a mistake there, so we can't do that too much. One thing I did want to find out is why did, uh, what, why would she call her name Spirit Spirit and not Princess? So that, that question was asked in there. You're, that's through, you know, you can't be called, you're a princess, you can't be called Spirit. But a nice, just a little hint of why she's called Spirit. Yes. That's, that's bit. Yeah, that, w- that would be interesting, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so are you going to... Thank you, well Stephanie. Done. Very nice of you to um, um, to review us. We review your work. You review us as well. That's how it works. So let's just see. Yes, you've just pushed your button, haven't you, Jeff? Yeah. It's still working, guys. Isn't that great? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so just looking at your numbers there. You liked the writing there, Jeff, didn't you? I did. I thought the writing was quite, I quite liked it. I thought it was confident writing, yes, I did. I think it was quite yeah. good. Yeah, you know, yeah. It, 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 you know, I wanted to read more about it, so but, uh, it's not really my topic, really, so yeah. my sort of area. Yeah. 
fair enough okay completely understood um thank you stephanie very much for that um I send it in again if you want with with a proper blurb I actually feel very bad about that yeah oh good thank you thank you stephanie let's have a look at the scoreboard now that we're over halfway it's ever so tight actually isn't it stefan has just gone in there at 48. Are there any final votes because the scoreboard will change automatically as uh, particularly as votes from the genius room come in if there's anybody who hasn't pressed the vote button yet please do um now then leave a comment for today's authors on youtube they want to know what you think Yes, please. That would be extremely helpful if you're watching on YouTube right now. Just le leave a little comment about your favourite submission and explain why. I'm going to talk to Bella about something called Tsunami Girl that you've just published. You run Guppy Books, don't you? You had an incredibly distinguished career um, creating bestsellers for other publishers. Now you've got your own publishing company, and this is this is one of your. How, how recent? How recent is this? Uh, we published it in March. And um, it is a part prose, part manga book for teenagers and for adults, actually. Um, and it's uh, it's about it's based on the 2011 um, earthquake and tsunami that happened in Japan. Hmm. Um, and a girl from the UK who has gone over to Japan, and it's about her recovery, really, her through creativity. So uh, she had created a, a superhero manga character and the manga character comes into the story and helps her grieve she loses her grandfather helps her grieve through it and, it, and the story sort of collide um it, it's a really fascinating way of telling a story and it works beautifully and we've had some wonderful responses yeah, I, i'm just looking at those reviews actually so you are in in your own quiet way quite disruptive actually aren't you you i mean you you like to push the boundaries because i'm thinking about uh, louisa reed who also is a very valued guest here on pop-ups as an author you, you you published her wrecked which was something i didn't everything could possibly work which was basically a novel in text form a, a text speak mm -hmm. but the reviews are extraordinary highly creative yeah. and this too seems as if you're pushing the boundaries a bit again i think so yes and i think um, the reason i um i mean i knew julian before but the reason i um was uh, published this book is he had gone to bigger publishers and and it had been thought to be too expensive to put the manga in as well but oh, really? It really you know it really isn't and it, it's such a great way of telling a story and chia kutsuwaza who is his collaborator um has created the most wonderful book and you know really it's just about taking a, yeah. a bit of a risk i think sometimes yeah. and the publishers of course can't necessarily do that so. they don't do um, they that's the interesting Interesting thing, thing, actually. But, yeah, yeah but pump, pump, to, down the chain, though, it's quite difficult to sort of say, let's do this and actually get the, the approval, isn't it? When you're, yeah, you know, it is. Yeah, well, that's yeah. that's the problem with corporate publishing, actually. That they, you know, they become less and less risk happy, more and more risk averse. Mm -hmm. Please just do the same as you did last year, but we'll have five percent more, and that's. Yeah, exactly. Not really what publishing is about, actually, is about being bold and being different and being maybe just, you know, half a step in front of the market. Uh, I just, I can't uh, let this pass without mentioning some of the great reviews you're getting in here. Um, another must, must read graphic novel, coming of age tale like the other, the Scotsman. And the Financial Times seems to be almost sort of, sort of kind of bored with your ability to produce amazing <laughs> books. Uh, there's another original powerful novel from, from Bella. Oh, well, of course. Oh. <laughs> how, 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 how extraordinary, yeah. I haven't um, taken them from the <laughs> No, well, yeah, you probably couldn't actually. I want to, um, to ask you though. You got a nose for for interesting books. You got a nose for books that go on to to be to be big, whether it's Hollywood or whatever else. We'll find out in a minute. What is that instinct? What is it about? A lot of lot of writers want to know this. What is it about? You know, the manuscript when you when you when you look at it or you open up an email or something. What is it that really sets your your hair on end and you start to think, hmm, this could be good. I think it's it's a combination of confidence with the writer, and there's a shit that you know I can feel it. It's a visceral feeling of excitement that you've got somebody here who's done something that's bigger and better than you could have imagined. I think. Wow. It's, yeah. It's, it's and that is partly confidence, but it's ability, isn't it? It's a, and yeah. also the big thing I think uh, for me is if it changes my emotions somehow 
then I listen because that's essentially what you know great stories do. They actually change yeah. the way you feel, and it's very rare I find for me that I, I, I agree. Have that so. I agree. Yes, yeah. authors listen and learn from Bella. She knows what she's talking about. Thank you, Bella. We're going to find out uh, what you were lying about in a few moments. Right now, let's look at submission number four, everyone. Submission four. This is from Nick, who I know is also with us. Nick Loretta. Hello, Nick. It's cosy. Oh, I like that. Cosy slash traditional mystery. Um, but yeah, is that a genre? Yes, it's a genre. Of course it is. Sort of uh, Agatha Raisin, maybe. Uh, Agatha Christie, kind of cosy. A deadly walk in Devon. And this is Nick's blurb. It sounded like the perfect getaway. A week-long guided walk along the North Devon coast in Western England. Ex-police detective Rick Chasen also hoped it would help him recover from the recent death of his partner, Doug. But when one of the walking party is found dead at the base of a coastal cliff, Chase fires up his dormant detection skills to help the police track down the killer, while also beginning a budding romance with the county coroner. Okay. Let me tell everybody about you, Nick. Uh, I'm focusing on mystery writing after a 40-year award-winning career in public relations and corporate communications. I've written textbooks and produced a feature and a produced feature screenplay. Very good. I'd like to know which which one that was. That would help a lot uh, when you're writing to agents. You should you should include that. Um, one of my short stories was featured in the anthology Made in LA. Like my protagonist, I love long distance walking. And England, I'm two thirds of the way towards my goal of walking in all 38 English counties. I didn't know there were 38, so thank you for the education. Uh, I live in Pasadena, California with my husband, Bert. I plan to use my pen name, Nicholas George. Right, so we've got a bit of cosy crime coming up. So it's really got to be K to read it, I think. A Deadly Walk in Devon by Nick Dorator, read by Kay. Chapter 1. Sunday, midday, Barnstable, Devon, England. The afternoon sky was that shade of clear, bright blue one only finds in England in the spring. I rolled my suitcase along the narrow pavement, its wheels clicking over the stones, carefully manoeuvring between people on their way to and from the old market town's shops. On the street, small cars and vans passed in brief intervals. The activity was typical for a Sunday. I started whistling Hank Williams' Why Don't You Love Me in a sprightly cadence that matched my steps. I felt energised, but something was wrong. I should have reached the roundabout leading to the river road. Instead, I only saw the street stretch before me into infinity. Good Lord, was this another of my screw-ups? I'd studied the online map so carefully. If Doug were here, he'd be ripping me apart. My mood shifted and my whistling stopped. There was no denying it. I was lost. I continued walking but paused at the next intersection. Was I supposed to turn here? Nothing. Not the Ladbrokes betting parlour on the far corner or the Tudor beamed building opposite looked familiar. I turned away, my frustration mounting with each step. Why on earth had I decided to come to England? I must have been insane. Clearly, I wasn't ready for this. There was too much sensory overload, too many details to remember, and worst of all, too many memories. Everywhere I looked, I saw Doug, hamming it up inside a red phone box. He'd made a prank call posing as an amazingly credible James Mason, stuffing his mouth at a fish and chip shop, gazing in wonder at the fascinating juxtaposition of the old against the new. Even as he got older, he never lost his boyish curiosity or sense of adventure. And me? Well, I hadn't lost my innate capacity for getting turned around, that was for sure. It was one of the reasons I always join an organised walking tour whenever I come to England. An experienced guide keeps me from making wrong turns and heading down blind pathways, something I'm all too prone to do on my own. After two more turns into passageways and alleys that were definitely not on the way to Barnstable's train station, I began to panic. The symptoms flared immediately. Rapid breathing, fuzzy vision, accelerated heartbeat, 
but there was nothing I could do to stop them. Was I about to have a heart attack? I started walking faster and more carelessly, staggering as I loped along, unsure if I was on the pavement or, Chase, watch out! I leapt back as a red Vauxhall raced past, missing me by inches. Damn, I said. The scare brought me to my senses. I was standing beside a busy street grasping my suitcase, still unsure of where I was, until I noticed the Edwardian era train station across the road. A short woman with tightly curled ginger and grey hair ran over and gave me a quick, warm hug. Haven't changed, have you? Honestly, Chase, why can't you learn how they drive here? They even have a look right and look left written on the asphalt. Billy, I said as I returned the hug and felt my breath returning to normal. Boy, oh boy, it's good to see you. My long-time companion from many walking trips was clad in one of her colourful self-knit sweaters. I don't know what I'd do without you scolding me. How the hell are you? Much better now I know you won't need to be scraped up off the street, she said. Grasping my hand, she led me across the road, both of us looking left and right, before pulling our cases behind us. When we reached the other side, I said, maybe I'm still fuzzy after the flight yesterday, but I knew that wasn't the real reason. You'll get acclimatised soon, Billy replied. You always do. I took another glance at her sweater, a tightly woven purple and yellow creation with a pattern that looked like moose performing a ballet. It reminded me of when I first met her on a walk in Northumberland. What was it, six years before? Our combined love of England and literature made us fast friends. Thank you very much, Nick, or as I should probably call you Nicholas, actually. Uh, but you've told everyone now what your pseudonym is, so... What's the point? Um, Charim is uh, is pretty much of a mind, actually. Uh, Kate says, confident prose. Um, Vagabond says, funny, I can't get that excited, upset about the idea of a dude getting slightly lost. And uh, yes, I think I agree with that, especially on the first page or two of a book. Uh, Lex says, I like this so far. The first paragraph officially gave us the setting. We have a sense of the character through voice, and we already have an internal struggle issue the character has to deal with. Nice. And I think most people think it's a fairly commercial genre. Jeff, is this going to float your boat? Yes, it did, actually. I really enjoyed it. So I thought it was a very good writing. Um, I like the story. I like the blurb and um, the title. Um, I think it's a sort of book you'd, you'd have really eat in front of a log fire with a glass of red wine. Or Isn't beach. it? Kind of yes. Relaxing. Yeah, exactly. It's a relaxing sort of book. To read. It's Once not demanding, read, but yeah. 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 No, no, I thought it was uh, very good. Yeah, enjoyed it. Yeah. Okay, so you've given the title uh, 80 or actually four stars, same thing. Uh, blurb you weren't so keen on, but the rest of it, actually, this looks like a winner for you. I wonder if it's the same for Bella. Oh, yeah. yeah, I really liked it. Um, I mean, I thought um, I gave the craft four, I think. Yeah, four mm -hmm. out of five. Um, I did think it could be really cut down, uh, that whole bit getting lost bit, but what it did uh, very nicely was set the scene, set, give him give some past. And I really like the uh, dialogue and the relationship between the two people. Um, I thought it was great. I really enjoyed it. I, uh, yeah, strong writing. Strong writing, says Rachel, uh, YouTube, but hasn't grabbed me. Um, let's just ask Bella. So you've given it this 80% uh, uh, four stars out of five for bang, which is what, yeah. what our shorthand for commercial appeal. So you think this is solidly commercial? I do. I think, I, mm. well, it just made me think of Richard Osman, or, you know, those kind of books that are yeah. uh, really high up there now. And, and people are wanting that kind of cozy thing with it, also with emotional backstory as well. Um, and also some, some thrill, but it's quite safe as well. So I, yes. I think it's definitely got commercial potential. Fantastic. Great. That's very good news. Uh, doesn't feel mysterious, says Rachel. Just looking at the chat room vote there. Uh, there's much of a muchness there between mid-60s and 70s. Good. All right. Let's uh, now see the impact of the scoreboard. And as I suspected, actually, Nick, yeah, you have surged into the lead there with a 69 overall. And that could change a little bit um, over the next few minutes. There's possibly one or two late voters in the chat room catch up. i tell you what I want to do now, though. I want to ask Jeff first mm. if he can figure out, because I can't, which one Bella was lying about. 
I'm not sure. I can't figure it out either. I would say. <laughs> really take can't. a guess. Take a guess. Number You're going to be fifty percent. The first one, yeah. The first the one, Hollywood which film. which is the two Hollywood, Hollywood yeah. films. All oh, right, so yeah, I agree with that. We think you were not telling the truth about that. No, that was the truth. And oh, actually, you might come and vote for the more introduction, which was before I die, which became now is good, which I don't think it did very well, but it was a Hollywood film, and then the boy in the striped pajamas, you see, was a Hollywood film. Oh. Um, and the other one is actually we've had four Sunday Times children. Oh the my week. God! <laughs> you were fa- it was false oh, modesty. <laughs> that doesn't that doesn't count as a lie. Being falsely <laughs> modest. Oh no. dear, I oh, dear. Ka- I hold Kate, Kate entirely responsible for this. You said she taught you how to lie, and she didn't. Oh no. All right, let's see how good you are at uh, sussing out the truth. Then Jeff gave us two highly improbable stories. One about him being an ele- eleven-year-old baby driver and the other one about Teddy Roxpin <laughs> underpants, which do you think is not true? I think the driving one is not true. I think the All Russian right. one is, is uh, partly because I think it's the funniest story. So like yeah, it yeah he, he went on a bit, didn't he, actually? It's quite it's a yeah, long blurb, it? that was, actually. All right, Jeff, reveal all. Yes, the Russian story was the one. That's, that was oh, true. Right. It was true, it was true. That's what we <laughs> thought. Yeah. All right, so you were not a baby driver. Thank oh. you very much, guys. No. Thank you, Nick. Yes, fantastic to have you along live. Give us a good review if you want, or don't. That's the idea, Stephanie, actually. That is the idea that um, it's interesting. You know, you can learn a lot about the craft by reviewing other people's work because it's actually the same old mistakes that people make most of the time. And you can kind of, reading other people's work sensitizes you to those mistakes and you read it in a slightly different way and you're much less likely to make those mistakes yourself. However, we have one final submission of the day. This is submission number five, please, on your score sheets. It's from Shoshana Rogers. I'm not sure if you're with us, Shoshana Live, but if you are, give us a shout out. It's comedy science fiction. I would like that. Totally spaced out, colon, in the beginning. All right, is that a subtitle or what? I don't know. It's quite a long title. This is Shoshana's blurb. In this fast-paced galactic caper, the race is on to find Princess Sura, I guess I'm saying that right, who's prophesied to be the mother of the star child who threatens Lord Luna's reign over the universe. I think I've got that. Uh, He'll stop at nothing to prevent the little brat's conception. However, a space pirate, ooh, we like space pirates, who's nothing but trouble, a busty erotician, Have I said that right? I don't know. Uh, I'm so confused. A treasure hunting Vicorian, uh, Vicorian? And a chain smoking android stand in his way. Would that be a phone perhaps? Will the heroes manage to secure the princess's destiny or will they be spliced and diced? I don't totally understand what's going on, but then I don't always. Uh, Let me tell you about um, Stephanie. I'm a sci-fi geek who grew up on a diet of the Alien franchise, uh, The Thing and Hammer Horror. I'm a huge fan of the Rocky Horror Show and devoured Red Dwarf on a weekly basis. When it comes to reading, it has to be Stephen King, Terry Pratchett, Dean Koontz and Marvel DC Universe. My ultimate superhero is Superman. Really? Isn't it a bit bland? It's the muscles, you say. It's the muscles. <laughs> I began writing comedy monologues at college on a performing arts course. When I'm not on board spaceships and getting lost in graveyards, I like to tell my kids scary fairy stories and soak up the sun's rays with a glass of chilled beer in my hand. All at the same time, I wonder. Somewhat idiosyncratic there, I think, Shishana. So it obviously means we're going to have to ask Kate to deliver the final reading of the day. Totally Spaced Out by Shoshana, read by Kate. In the beginning, the prologue. One, because all the best adventures begin with one. Two, you'd be lost if this bit wasn't written in. In the beginning, and I'm talking about the absolute beginning, before stars, planets, life forms and social media, hamburgers, childminders, lampposts and overly talkative taxi drivers were even thought of, there was absolutely nothing. Nothing existed. So there was quite literally nothing except for a deep, dark, vacuous void of nothingness. Nothing. And even more, nothing. It was like this for literally millions and trillions of years. 
One day it was just minding its own business doing absolutely nothing as usual because when you're a void there is nothing to do. Then it happened. Two lines of electrical matter formed out of this void, lighting up the place like a torch in the blackest, most frightful forest you can ever think of. One was a masterful array of silvery blue, whilst the other was a soft but dazzling pink. They seemed to like each other. You could almost say that they had said, Hello, how you doing? They danced without touching, chased one another up and down the void, and quickly it became apparent that a mutual attraction had begun. One could not resist the other. The two lines twirled and spiralled around without making any contact, but I think, as the writer of this book and being the red-hot blooded woman that I am, I would say that their sexual chemistry was at boiling point. The temptation to take things to another level proved way too much. Silvery Blue had found a mate in Dazzling Pink, so he showed off his prowess to make her his by circling her, weaving in and out of her way. She followed him wherever he went. He became bolder. Silvery Blue went into Dazzling Pink. At first his movements were slow, quite gentle, then his movements became more intense and more urgent. Silvery Blue needed Dazzling Pink. Dazzling Pink needed Silvery Blue. Dazzling Pink was very receptive and I believe she was in ecstasy. What female wouldn't be with a lover like this? She returned his lust by caressing him, which sent out spirally sparks that made him move more desperately to please her. Their movements vibrated the void, sending out sound waves to the very depths of the vacuum. Silvery blue and dazzling pink both reached the height of their pleasure. The orgasmic sound waves coming from both lines of matter spread out to the vast edges of the void, but when that happened, they absorbed into each other to make a mauve sphere. At first glance, you wouldn't have thought that the sphere was up to much. However, minutely, the sphere began to bubble and divide and fold in on itself. It vibrated, gyrated, changing shape the bigger it grew. Bang! The spherical shape was scattered amongst the void, floating out into the never-ending blackness. Tiny specks of light shone in the darkness some more than others. Vast amounts of gas spurted out from the muddy matter that was being left behind to form clouds of stars, suns, moons. In fact, billions of galaxies were formed to make their own neighbourhoods. They all swirled and floated around what we now know to be space, gracefully like ballerinas. Pointed stars flexed out balletic shards of light, reaching out to nearby moons and planets to give life, but it was not the only life this once dark and lonely space made. Even deeper into what was the void, two supreme beings were formed to rule the universe together as one. Lucian and Lunus. Lucian was heavenly to look at. In fact, he was very alluring, with piercing green eyes and a muscular physique. His skin glistened like smelted gold, and his hair was thick with carefree ebony waves. Lunus was stocky, fleshy, with powerful arms and legs. His skin was dusky with violet overtones. He wore a metallic helmet which controlled his tight, corkscrew scarlet locks. Both created to be powerful. Both created to rule the universe. And, for trillions of light years, everything was okay. Together, they formed a firm base of operations. Okay, uh, dearly beloved brethren, what are we to make of this? Um, says, uh, Vagabond says, or simply put, Mummy and Daddy did the special cuddle and the Earth was born. <laughs> That's sweet. <laughs> Um, Lex says something. Oh, I think it's uh, it's scrolled off actually. 
Lots of lots of reaction here. Uh, Alex says, uh, "Okay, did you know what you were getting into reading this?" Uh huh. And um, writing is good, says Hannah. Story is not holding my interest. There's not much story. Several people have actually said though that there's a voice there, and they they rather like it. I'm a bit puzzled by this. What do you think, Bella? I'm a bit puzzled as well. Um, I uh, I think the writing is good, but I just didn't really engage with it. I didn't find it really interesting. I know, it, and I'm not a big science fiction fan, so I have to put that in at the beginning. Um, I haven't even read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which I know a lot of people. Oh my god! <laughs> I know. <laughs> You're not, not a fan, done. are you? You really aren't. No. Oh wow! So I, you know, maybe I should just not really be in this round. But um, yeah, I thought she. I thought there was a lot of humour there, and it yeah. was funny. I think it could have been really tight. I mean, it just it, it went. The humour went on too much. It was too overtold. I think for me. Yeah, I yeah, um, yeah. I can't disagree with that. that. Um, just looking to see what the genius room are doing. They're kind of middling on this, really, aren't they? Um, yeah, middling. Oh, it just changed that. Just changed, which actually affects your overall vote there, Shishana. Let's let's ask Jeff for his his reactions. Um, Douglas Adam fan. No, no, again, I'm, <gasps> I'm like, I'm not, heresy, I'm not heresy. Fan, so not really <laughs> <You> see, <laughs> science fiction, what's that? Um, but uh, no, I, I thought I thought I thought in there there was some some good writing. Um, it was sustainable, but it was just too much for me. It just seems like a, there's too many words there. I just need editing down. And it seemed like yeah. you know, a nice phrase, a pleasant phrase was used about pink and, and blue and things, but it was it was repeated over and over again, which seemed to be a bit monotonous, really. I, I, I didn't particularly like it. Um, I'm, I, I, what, what, how this actually sustains into reading, but this is the prologue, I presume, how that actually sort of becomes a, a, a book after that, how you could actually build this round to have a book, I'm not sure. It might um, might be a very it's small book. book. It's possible. It could well be. <laughs> Perhaps it's just a prologue. I don't know. <laughs> but no, I, I, it's, I, it's okay, but not my, not, not, not my sort of cup of tea at all. Okay, fair enough. Understood. Thank you very much. But I think I think that a lot of people in the chat room do think that there is a voice there, actually, Shishana. Shishana. But um, what I don't say really. It's very, very different, isn't it? It's very different. Um, I think it is idiosyncratic. I'm not sure I would know how to sell this. So. Um, basic message would be you've got a voice if you've got a voice then you can you can do most things actually writing voice now let's press the final button of the day to see how the numbers look okay so i think i think the message is pretty clear from that a deadly walk in devon cozy slash traditional mystery by nick duretta reading by k of course way out in front today way out in front congratulations nick you are this week's winner and let me just say um thank you to everybody as you know this has been a beta test of something that's hello sharon i'm delighted to know that thank you leave us a good review if you if you want to um thank you so much everyone who's been involved today um you won't believe the amount of work that's gone on behind the scenes just to get the the new scoring system working and it works i can't believe it yeah, well yeah. <laughs> oh, you gave me a nasty minute jeff actually a nasty moment when we're, yeah okay, awesome. and you forgot to press your button didn't you oh yeah well, just, i think i thought i had actually you know, it's obviously an age yeah <laughs> but, but it, it, it all it all worked out really well and, and thank you yeah. everyone behind the scenes obviously rachel obviously kate who actually you don't know this because we didn't have to fall back because uh, the system has worked it's proved its worth but uh there was a, a backup system that was basically called kate and she was ready to to step in with with her special spreadsheet um thank you very much nick so this is a beta version of the new show we'll, we'll be adding um more features very soon we will be back with you next week um and i want to say thank you everyone in the chat room as well please the genius room for being the genius as you are giving the feedback that you do and adapting to the new system and i think actually we've got some pretty positive uh, feedback on the new system so we can only go on to do uh, greater things um i'm off for a few days to uh, to paddle in whitstable which is where Jeeves used to go for two weeks every year. I hope to see him there, but more importantly, I hope to see you this time next Sunday. Good night.
Do 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 